Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name, uh, my name is Carm, and I am your moderator for today. On behalf of Ministry to Muslims, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us. My job as moderator is not to announce who wins or loses. We want you to hear both sides and let you be the judge. I'm here to enforce the time frame and to maintain order of this debate. This great debate series was designed to give both Christians and Muslims a chance to present and or defend their positions on various Islamic and Christian topics. Rather than simply agreeing to disagreeing or making compromises and concessions, our method puts each side's belief system under scrutiny. Both sides know that their faith will be challenged and evidence will be needs to be presented. We welcome your questions. Please submit them to us in the live chat before the closing statements are done by tagging the word QUESTION, all in caps, followed by your questions. Before we welcome our debaters, I'd like you to let you know that Ministry to Muslims would like to see this event be conducted in a spirit of reverence and order. In light of this, Ministry to Muslims is asking our online moderators to ex exercise a zero tolerance policy regarding any improper remarks in the chat. Our topic for this debate is salvation according to the Quran. Representing the Muslim position is Dr. Shabir Ali. Dr. Ali holds a BA in religious studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario with a specialization in biblical literature. He holds an MA and a PhD from the University of Toronto with a specialization in Quranic exegesis. He is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in uh, Toronto, where he functions as Imam. He travels internationally to present Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues. He explains Islam on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. If you would like to see past episodes, they can be found on www.quranspeaks.com. Representing the Christian position is Reverend Anthony Rogers. Reverend Rogers received an AA degree in Christian thought from Christ College in Lynchburg, Virginia, and graduated with a divinity degree from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He is an ordained pastor in the Presbyterian Church of America and serves as the regional director for Metanona Prison Ministries in South Carolina. He has published articles in numerous theological journals, is a co-author of the book, Our God is Triune, and he runs a YouTube channel under his name, Anthony Rogers. He is married and has four children. Let's begin. We will be starting with the affirmative, Dr. Shabir Ali, followed by the opposition, Reverend Anthony Rogers. Dr. Shabir, you have 16 minutes to build your case for salvation according to the Quran. Okay, I'll just get my um, notes ready here. And in a moment, here we go. So I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, uh, I greet you with a greeting of peace, and uh, I pray that God will protect us all uh, in this uh, uh, situation in which we all uh, face the possibility of, uh, of COVID-19. We pray for protection uh, from ev every disease, sickness, uh, disease, and uh, stress. At the same time, uh, we all uh, are glued to our television sets. We're looking at events around the world, and we are praying for peace, for stability, uh, for the end of violence, for the uh, upliftment of the rights uh, and, and status of women uh, in our own countries and worldwide. Uh, in this opening speech, I intend not to defend, but merely to explain the Quranic view of salvation and to show how it ties in with uh, belief in God and Jesus. I will begin by outlining the main points and then uh, proceed to elaborate. My first main point is that God is intrinsically forgiving and he readily forgives us because he understands our fallible nature. Second, the Quranic story of Adam is about original forgiveness, not about original sin. After Adam's momentary lapse, God forgave, chose, and guided him. Uh, divine justice is thus tempered with mercy and God's care for humans. Third, the devil tries to mislead humans, but due to God's forgiving nature and uh, continuing care for humans, the devil uh, cannot succeed in permanently misleading sincere servants of God. Fourth, 
faith in God and in ultimate accountability in the life hereafter naturally lead to good works. Thus, uh, the Quran often couples faith and works as the twin criteria of salvation. Thankfully, God in his mercy multiplies our meager good works in his records, where, whereas he minimizes or even erases our sins. Given those four points, it is inconceivable that God would have predestined some specific persons to hell, de-emphasizing stark determinism, the dominant Islamic tradition professed that humans have limited freedom within divine constraints. I will explain a way of conceiving of this fine balance between divine control and human freedom by drawing on quantum indeterminacy. Finally, I will explain how the Quranic view ties in with God's plan of salvation, and I will suggest a way for Muslims to believe it likely that people of other faiths would also be saved. So let's turn to our uh, uh, Muslim conception of, of God. Three aspects of Muslim monotheism are relevant to our concept of salvation. First, belief in the one God is a key criterion for salvation. The Quran says in Surah 41, verse number 30, As for those who say, Our Lord is God, and take the straight path towards him, the angels come down to them and say, Have no fear or grief, uh, have no fear or grief, but rejoice in the good news of paradise, which you have been promised. My second uh, point about uh, Islamic monotheism is that God is merciful. Uh, this is emphasized in the Quran at the end, the, the beginning of almost every chapter, as it reads, in the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. Such emphasis on God's mercy implies that God is not cruelly seeking a way to punish humans. Rather, he is mercifully working out, working out ways to save us. The Quran says God is most compassionate and most merciful towards people. Third, God is forgiving and loving. The Quran says that he is the most forgiving, the most loving, Surah 85, verse number 14. Hence, we know that God is willing to forgive us our trespasses. The Quran employs the name Gafar for God, indicating that he forgives again and again. Another name, Tawwab, relenting repeatedly, is often paired with Rahim, merciful, to read he is ever relenting, the most merciful, for example, in Surah 2, verse 37. Hence, God of his own merciful nature often chooses to forgive our tr uh, trespasses. He also promises to forgive us if we sincerely repent, rectify the harm done to others, and follow up with good deeds. Divine justice, thus, is tempered with mercy. What about our understanding of the human condition? As the poet Alexander Pope wrote in his An Essay on Criticism, to err is human. To forgive is divine. The Quran concurs, saying, for example, man was created weak, Surah 4, verse 28. Therefore, God declares that he intends to lighten our burdens. Uh, moreover, God will not task us beyond our capacity. Despite our infallibility, despite our fallibility, rather, uh, God created us with a natural disposition to believe in him. The, uh, the Quran speaks of the natural disposition God instilled in humankind uh, in Surah 30, verse number 30. The Quran emphasizes elsewhere that human souls have been imbued with moral failings as well as a consciousness of God, for example, in Surah uh, 91, verse number 8. In sum, we are born with a natural disposition to recognize the one God, but we are also given the free choice to turn away. In his book, Sin and Salvation in the World Religions, Harold Coward writes, nowhere does the Quran teach that human nature is basically flawed and must be regenerated. Hence, in the Quran, God's primary concern is to guide humans to maintain their original natural relationship with God. Thus, God has been sending prophets and messengers to redirect humans who have fallen off the path. It is when we deliberately turn away from that faith the faith of the prophets, that we fall into damnation, unless God chooses to forgive us, of course, which he will do if we sincerely repent, make restitution where possible, and follow up with good deeds. So now we come to the story of Adam. The Quran has a unique angle on the story of Adam. The moral of the story includes God's forgiveness and guidance. As Harold Coward writes, although the Quran acknowledges that Adam did indeed sin, 
his sin was not passed down to all humankind. That's on page 60 of his book, Sin and Salvation in the World Religions. In the Quranic story, Satan whispered to Adam and his wife and caused them to slip from their blissful state. The human couple ate, ate from the tree, the tree of immortality, and became aware of their private parts. What were they to do now? Adam received words of repentance from his Lord. Using these words, the couple prayed, Our Lord, we have wronged our souls. If you do not forgive us and have mercy, we shall be lost. That's mentioned in Surah 7, verse 23. As a result, God forgave Adam. Moreover, God chose Adam, relented towards him, and guided him, according to Surah 7, verse 122. God then declared that uh, guidance will come to humankind from time to time, so that whoever follows that guidance will neither fear nor grieve, whereas those who turn away from the guidance will face dire consequences in the day, on the day of resurrection according to Surah 20, verses 122 to 123. This is the correct reference, even when I said Surah 7, verse 122. That should have been Surah 20, verse 122. Thus, uh, the Quranic story is about God's guidance and forgiveness. But if God forgave Adam and Eve, why penalize them by having them exit the garden? The answer is that the couple's exit from the Garden of Eden was not a penalty for sin, rather, it was a natural outcome of God's original plan to populate the earth with humans. In the garden, God taught the couple an original lesson before sending them into the world. And the Quran repeats that lesson for us by saying, for example, Children of Adam, do not let Satan seduce you as he did your parents, causing them to leave the garden, stripping them of their garments to expose their nakedness to them. He and his forces can see you from where you cannot see them. According to the Quran, Surah 7, verse 27. In sum, Satan will trick us from time to time, but God is always willing to pick us up when we fall. Thus, the Quran has no doctrine of original sin. The Quran stresses that no soul will bear the burden of another, according to Surah 35, verse 18, for example. However, those who mislead others will carry the burden of their own sins while bearing some responsibility for misleading others, Surah 16, verse 23. We need to be saved from our sins. Every soul is held in pledge for its deeds. What saves us is the mercy of God meted out in response to sincere repentance, repairing the harm we have done to God's creatures, to the best of our abilities, and recommitting ourselves to doing the best we can henceforth. What about our view of devils? God is in full control of his creation, including Satan and his entourage. As God's creatures, Satan and other evil forces are all subjected to God. They can do nothing without his permission. After Satan misled, misled Adam and his spouse, uh, Satan begged God for reprieve until the day of judgment. God granted his request with the express confidence that Satan, despite all his attempts, cannot permanently mislead the sincere servants of God, according to Surah 15, verse 40. He may cause us to stumble from time to time, but as God forgave Adam, so will he forgive us. But does that leave any ro room uh, for works? How can we be saved from the wiles of devils and from our own evil inclinations so that we can skip hell and dwell forever in paradise? The Quranic answer is that we believe and do good works. Or we believe and remain steadfast. Surah 41, verse number 30. Good deeds are the visible outcomes of faith. The Quran assures us that all deeds will be accounted for, large and small. The deeds will be weighed, and those whose scales are heavier with good deeds will pass and go to heaven. Those whose scales are lighter fail and fall into hell, unless, of course, God forgives them. Several factors assure Muslims of success. We are assured that God credits us for good deeds ten times over, whereas sins are counted against us at par, for example, according to Surah 6, uh, verse 160. Thus, God will gracefully grant us more reward than our works merit. Moreover, the Quran promises that good deeds drive away evil deeds, Surah 11, 114. The Quran likewise assures us that in the case of those who repent, 
uh, believe and do good deeds, God will change the evil deeds of such people into good ones. Surah 25 verse 70. In sum, while works are important as manifestations of faith, faith is more important and divine mercy is the ultimate factor assuring us of salvation. We come now to the question of predestination and I'm getting to the end of my opening speech. The Quran is clear that people have a choice of paths, Surah 18, verse 29. It repeatedly shows that people will reap what they sow, citing many other verses with the same import in his multi-volume encyclopedia of Sirah. Afzalur Rahman uh, concludes, these verses of the Quran give clear evidence that man is the maker and destroyer of his own destiny by himself. That's on page uh, 160 of uh, volume 6. Likewise, the late Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Ali al-Tantawi, wrote, If all human actions were predestined since eternity, with no scope for change, alteration, or option, there would have been no need to send prophets to this world. That's in his book, uh, The Faith, uh, General Introduction to Islam, uh, page uh, 113. Uh, note one. Classical Muslim theologians saw only two possible positions on the question. Either uh, we gave total control to God or we accept that there is another power uh, than God bringing about outcomes. A way out of this impasse was found with modern advances in quantum physics. We can now think of the universe as comprising a combination of fixity and flexibility, determinism and randomness. Thus, I believe that we can confidently assert both uh, divine determination of outer limits and human freedom within those limits. This view does full justice, does full justice to the passages of the Quran referred to above and the idea uh, of God sending prophets. God's statements and actions imply a certain degree of freedom and uh, responsibility. What about the role of Jesus? Jesus in the Quran belongs uh, to a long line of prophets, including Noah and Abraham. The role of Jesus in the salvation of the world is like that of prophets prior to him. He outlined for people a straight path for them to follow. He worshipped God and invited his followers to do likewise. Jesus' straight path included prayer, charity, and kindness to his mother. He relaxed some of the strictures of the Torah's laws, for example, as mentioned in Surah 3, verse 50 and 51, but did not cancel the law entirely. Is Jesus our intercessor? The Quranic view, in the Quranic viewpoint, Jesus and other prophets can intercede with God, but only after receiving God's permission to do so. Did Jesus die for our sins? The Quran considers it unreal that God would penalize uh, an innocent uh, person. Now, would Muslims be the only ones to go to heaven? The Arabic word Islam means submission, and the word Muslim is the active participle, meaning a submitter, and hence one who submits to God. The classical interpreters of the Quran adopted a view that Muslims alone will enter heaven, but they maintained with the Quran uh, that uh, uh, this includes all prophets from Adam to Jesus and their true followers. They were all Muslims, for they too were submitters to God. Yet the interpreters maintain that whoever has received the message uh, of Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, are obliged to believe in him or face damnation. I will refer to this as uh, a semi-exclusivist view. But even so, some holders of that classical semi-exclusivist view today accept that some non-Muslims today may not be in a position to judge the faith of Islam on its merits. Uh, thus, their denial of the faith may be based on misinformation and other factors. In that case, they will not be damned. So in, in short, uh, I would uh, argue for uh, a, 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 a broader expansion of this non-exclusivist, of this semi-exclusivist view. And I would say that uh, there is a possibility for people who are not Muslims uh, to being sincere as they are, doing the best they can to serve God according to whatever knowledge and information has reached them, uh, they too uh, will be saved in the end. However, I have full assurance uh, that the Islamic system of salvation works and that whoever embraces Islam and follows it steadfastly uh, will be saved in the end. And I hope to be one of those persons. Thank okay, you. thank you, Shabir. Uh, Reverend Anthony Rogers, you have 12 minutes to share your thoughts and objections to what you just heard from Dr. Ali. Okay, thank you so much, Carm and Dr. Ali. 
I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the only true triune God who loved me and saved me, and I pray that he'll do the same for Dr. Ali and other Muslims and anybody else who doesn't believe in Christ as Lord. Uh, talking about salvation, according to the Quran, from my perspective, is more than a little bit difficult. Uh, anyone who's read the Quran knows, and, and here Dr. Ali would openly acknowledge this, I believe, the Quran is not a systematic book. But uh, the, the real problem is that it doesn't even lend itself to being exegeted or systematized, in my view, into a coherent overall teaching on many issues, including salvation. Uh, after all, the Quran doesn't tell us when, where, or why certain verses or chapters were revealed, which is often critically important when interpreting something. You need to know the context. Uh, moreover, the Quran doesn't tell us which chapters or verses are before or after uh, each other, and so it's difficult to know which of Allah's changing commands or teachings are his final decisions on a matter. Uh, for example, as everybody's probably heard, in one place the Quran says people can't drink alcohol at all. In another place it says they can, just not before prayer. And then in still another place it says, uh, you know, it doesn't even restrict it uh, to that degree. According to Muslims, the first thing I said was the last thing Allah revealed and so reflects his final requirement. And the last thing I said uh, came earlier and re uh, reflects a decision that Allah later changed his mind about. But the Quran doesn't tell us that. It just has these differing commands in different places. And so this is one of many examples where a person is left wondering from the Quran alone what Allah requires. Uh, also, in many cases, when reading through a section of the Quran, it's difficult to tell uh, if it's talking about the same subject from one verse to the next. You can, you can be reading along about one thing and at some point realize that the subject switched somewhere along the way. And when you try and retrace your steps to find out where that switch took place, it's not clear. And so the question becomes, are we supposed to incorporate, incorporate this intervening material into our understanding of the earlier subject or the later subject? Uh, moreover, as Allah himself was forced to admit in Surah 3-7, as a result of the promptings of the Christians of Nadran, many verses of the Quran are not just difficult to understand, but are so unclear that they can be understood only by Allah which not only leaves us in the dark about the meaning of some of those statements, but also leaves us wondering what the point is in really revealing verses that don't reveal anything. Uh, in addition, the Quran tells us that those who try to understand the unclear verses have a diseased heart. You know, but since the Quran doesn't give us a list of which verses are only known by Allah and which verses can be understood, a person ventures at his own peril to either include or exclude verses from his overall understanding. The, the point that I'm driving at here is that all of this is inimical to exegesis, and without being able to arrive at a reliable exegetical conclusion about things the Quran says, it's impossible to see how various statements cohere with one another to produce an overall doctrine of salvation. What we're left with is trying to decide what salvation is from a book that lacks context, clarity, and coherence. And that, on so momentous a matter, is one's eternal destiny. Uh, now, one can try to bring in here the biographies, the commentaries, and the traditions to help the Quran out, uh, but this raises several issues, including uh, the fact that if the Quran is Allah's eternal speech, we have to wonder why it needs to be supplemented by these other sources, uh, things that aren't even considered to be Allah's eternal speech. Why does Allah's speech need props and crutches to hold it up? Secondly, the Hadith would bring in a whole host of other problems besides the ones I've already mentioned, not only with respect to the interpretation of the Quran, but specifically with respect to how people are saved. Uh, for example, according to the Hadith, one of the things Allah will do to save Muslims is by placing their sins on Jews and Christians to suffer hell in their place. Now, uh, Shabir and I have agreed to debate simply the Quran alone, and so I'm just bringing this up to point out I think the Quran uh, makes it very difficult and in certain cases impossible to really arrive at a systematic understanding. And perhaps that's why, as I think of some of the problems I have with the Islamic doctrine of salvation, it was uh, so easy for Dr. Ali to leave out a great many things that would really fill in the picture. While I don't believe the Quran is generally clear or capable of being systematized, I do believe it's uh, clear on some things, and a number of those things were left out, and I, I want to bring those in here. Uh, one of the first problems I have from the things that I can discern from the Quran is that it's not sufficient to place one's faith in Allah 
or in his words that came through Muhammad. Uh, that's the impression you might get from Dr. Ali when he talks about faith. He spoke of faith and good works, but with respect to faith, he spoke of Tawheed, believing in one God, believing in Allah alone. But according to the Quran, a person is not a true believer unless he believes in Allah and Muhammad. And notice it's not just Allah and the words that came through Muhammad, but the person of Muhammad, who is to be the object of people's faith, in addition to Allah. Surah 2642 says, true believers are only they who have attained to faith in Allah and his apostle, that is Muhammad. A second problem I have is that the Quran also teaches that Allah must be dearer to a person than anyone and anything else. Now, that in itself is not a problem. That is par for the course. If he's the true God, he's to be uh, dearer to us than anything else. But the Quran says the same thing must be true of Muhammad in our eyes in addition to Allah. Surah 924 says that Allah and uh, Muhammad must be dearer to Muslims than their family, their wealth, and any other thing or cause, and concludes by saying, Allah does not grace iniquitous people with his guidance, meaning Allah will not be gracious to anyone who does not make Muhammad, in addition to Allah, dearer to him than anything in all of creation. This sounds like a perversion of Deuteronomy 6, where it says we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, meaning him above all else, not him and some additional prophet in addition to him. Uh, third, at the heart of Islam is the requirement of rendering absolute submission to Allah. Again, this goes back to Shabir's point about believing in Tawheed. Uh, this is supposedly the heart of Islam, believing in Allah alone and submitting to him alone. But the Quran says that one must submit to Muhammad entirely, absolutely, without any tinge of dissent, not just Allah. Uh, and, and the problem here, as I see it, is that the, the sin of associating anyone with Allah, may, uh, submitting to anyone other than Allah, is considered an unforgivable sin. Surah 465 says, but no, by your Lord, they will not believe until they make you, Muhammad, a judge in their disputes, and then do not find in their hearts any dissent from your verdict and submit in full submission. That's supposed to be given to Allah alone, according to Muslims, according to the Quran, but uh, really the Quran here contradicts that. So one doesn't truly have faith unless they entirely submit to Muhammad without any dissent in the heart. And according to the same Quran revealed through Muhammad, it's an unforgivable sin to render absolute submission to anyone other than Allah. So you're literally damned if you do here and damned if you don't. Damned if you submit to Muhammad, because that's a violation of Tawheed, and damned if you don't submit to Muhammad, because Surah 465 says you must. So one has to believe in Muhammad, not in Allah alone, fully submit to Muhammad, not in Allah alone, make Muhammad dearer than everyone else, not Allah alone, obey Muhammad, not Allah alone. Uh, if we were also considering the so-called reliable hadith, there, would, there we'd see uh, that people also need Muhammad's intercession on the last day. You even hear, heard... Uh, Dr. Ali make reference to the intercession of prophets, but Muhammad's intercession is uh, the capstone of all of this, according to Muslims. Uh, but just judging by the Quran alone, it's apparent that Muhammad, along with Allah, plays a saving role for Muslims. They must rest their faith in him, submit to him with their whole heart, and love him more than anyone else. Otherwise, they don't even have true faith. Okay, a fourth problem I have is the idea that people, uh, well, the idea that people have to submit to Muhammad in their words and actions from the heart without any tinge of dissent is, is further troubling to me in light of the fact that Muhammad was a man full of doubts and sin. For example, in Surah 1094, one example of many, Allah said to Muhammad, if you are in doubt concerning what we reveal unto you, then go ask those who read the scriptures before you. And so the man that Muslims are told to believe in, to rest their faith in, have entire confidence in, was himself a man of imperfect faith. How is this an appropriate object of faith uh, for salvation? We're also told numerous times over that Muhammad was a sinful man. In Surah 40, 55, 47, 19, uh, 48, 1 through 2, Muhammad is told to ask forgiveness for his sins. In Surah 943, Muhammad is rebuked for acting before Allah made something clear to him. And so just like Muslims are taught that they can't have true faith unless they entirely submit to a man who had doubts, so likewise sinners are taught that their faith is to be in a man who himself was full of sins. And this becomes all the more hopeless, it seems to me, when one looks at the early traditions, which are, I think, appropriately avoided if you want to talk about this sort of thing, uh, because the, uh, they don't present a pretty picture of the sorts of sins that Muhammad had on his record. 
Uh, fifth, the, the Quran teaches that good deeds atone for and take away evil deeds. You did hear Dr. Ali mention that Allah will replace bad deeds with good deeds. But Surah 2, 271 says that secretly giving to the poor will atone for sins. And Surah 11, 114 says good deeds take away evil deeds. But in my mind, that's like failing to pay rent in January and then paying rent in February and saying, since I paid February's rent, I don't have to pay January's rent. Right. Uh, you know, it appears to me whoever said this has never watched the people's court. Uh, that just just doesn't fly. Uh, so I have numerous problems with the Islamic view of salvation. Now, this isn't per se my rebuttal period, but I do want to try and bring in some of the other things that Dr. Ali mentioned. One of the things that Dr. Ali mentioned and I was surprised by is the claim that the Quran doesn't teach predestination and even that this is not the view of, of Muslims classically. At least that's what I thought Dr. Ali said. But the Quran is replete with statements that Allah has chosen whether a person will go to heaven or hell. Uh, in Surah 16, verse 93, it says, had Allah willed, he could have made you one nation, but he sends astray whom he wills and he guides whom he wills. Uh, Surah 16, 9 says, had he willed, he would have guided you all. Uh, in Surah uh, 32, 13 through 14, it says, if Allah, uh, if we had willed, uh, we could have given every soul its guidance. But now my word is realized, assuredly, I shall fill Gehenna with jinn and men together. Uh, and on and on, the Quran is replete with this sort of thing. And again, so are the traditions. Uh, Dr. Ali, in his first point, said God is intrinsically forgiving. And I'd certainly grant here that there are all sorts of statements made about Allah being merciful and gracious and so forth. But in light of all the other things I've said, it doesn't strike me that Allah lives up to those names and titles. Allah is not supremely gracious and forgiving if uh, Muhammad, uh, if, if a person's salvation is contingent upon uh, having entire faith in and fully submitting to and considering as dearer Muhammad, a fa fallible, sinful, doubtful man uh, who is guilty of all sorts. Okay, of Anthony, thank you, Reverend Anthony. Okay, so Dr. Shabir, you have eight minutes for your rebuttal. Go ahead. Dr. Shabir, you need to turn your mic on. So here we go, all right. Okay, so Anthony, thank you for that uh, active engagement and let me respond to your points uh, in order. You say that the Quran is difficult to interpret, but uh, of course, uh, scriptures in general are difficult to interpret. Are you saying the Bible is not difficult to, in, uh, to interpret with so many different sects all basing their beliefs on the Bible and arguing strenuously with uh, proofs from, from the Bible. As for the idea that uh, God changed his mind with reference to alcohol, there is no uh, evidence of this in the Quran. All you have is that the Quran is making partial statements about alcohol. Uh, some of the earlier statements may give the impression that yes, uh, though uh, alcohol is mostly bad, it's not uh, declared yet to be totally forbidden. And then God later on declares it to be totally forbidden. That doesn't mean that God changed his mind. It just means that God has given people in that early Muslim community time uh, to become acculturated to the new Muslim set of beliefs uh, and understandings, after which they will be ready to receive the total commandment to uh, stay away from alcohol altogether. And the fact that some verses are unclear, that too does not make the Quran very different from other scriptures. There are things which are unclear in the Bible as well. Uh, as for hadith, you rightly said that our topic is not about hadith. And then I, I'm surprised that at the end, you, you said that, well, we need Muhammad's intercession according to hadith. So you're still making a point from, from the hadith. And as for the idea of how people are saved according to the hadith, because this is our... Um, 
uh, our topic is about the Quran. I will stick to the Quran and not deal with that uh, question for the moment. Now, you said that there are things that I left out. I didn't mention uh, that Muhammad has to be believed in. And I take correction there. Yes, that should have been an important part of my presentation. I should have been, I've spoken about belief in, in Muhammad as well. But I wanted to present uh, the idea of Quranic salvation as being more basic than this. Uh, yes, uh, for Muslims, once we get the message of Muhammad and it's presented to us or to anyone else in a manner that is clear and complete and persuasive, then one has the obligation to accept that prophet. Otherwise, one will be held accountable before God for refusing God's uh, emissary. Uh, but uh, the salvation that I presented from the Quranic pages uh, is even more basic than this. The people who do not know about the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace will still be saved. And that's the basic level that I tried to present. Um, now, as for absolute salvation, uh, uh, submission to Allah alone, does, is that contradictory to the Quranic passages that uh, um, enjoin upon us to submit to Muhammad entirely? Well, uh, no, because we should understand that these are two different levels of submission. When we submit to God, we are submitting to him as God. And when we submit to Muhammad, we are submitting to him as the emissary from God who brings us God's commands, commandments and teachings. So by completely accepting the teachings that he brings from God, we are indirectly submitting to God by submitting to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But can we worship the Prophet Muhammad? Absolutely not. And this is why you find that despite the many sects and followings of Muslims, all Muslims maintain that there is no God but God, the, the God of Muhammad himself. And uh, the, yes, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a human being. Uh, he can have doubts like the rest of us, but God tells him how to deal with those doubts, uh, to seek clarification, to look for evidence. And uh, yes, he's uh, a human being like us, and uh, he can commit sins. Uh, uh, he's, he's a human being after all. Uh, but uh, God forgives his sins according to the Quran. Uh, so the very fact that the Quran is speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even rebuking him, as you said, uh, this shows that the Quran is coming from a mind that is other than the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's mind. And uh, that gives Muslims actually confidence that the Quran is really the word of God. And uh, as for the Quran saying that good deeds repel evil deeds and charity atones uh, for, for sins, you say that's like paying rent in February uh, and missing the January's uh, rent. But what if you, in February, you paid for both January and February? What if you have a gracious landlord who will not take you to pe people's court? Who will say, you know what, I understand your circumstances, you missed a January rent because of the COVID situation, because you were out of work or whatever reason, I forgive you the January rent. So it doesn't uh, entail a people's court. I think, Anthony, you, your, your example here is not appropriate because when we're talking about God, we're talking about the forgiving and the merciful one. He can easily forgive us for the sins and the lapses uh, that we commit. As for predestination, you have rightly quoted some verses which have been used by Muslim scholars uh, to justify a predestinarian view, but none of these actually uh, go the full length of, uh, of proving the predestinarian view. As for uh, those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has our God uh, glorified and exalted be he, uh, is, is, is saying that he's choosing, he is choosing those people who are also choosing him, who are choosing to believe and do right. It's not that they are pre-chosen before the creation for paradise and some others are pre-chosen for hell. That would be rather unfair and to seem unwise. Uh, as for the verse 16, verse 9, that says that had God will, he would have guided you all. Yes, he could have made sure that everybody is on the right guidance, but that was not his will. His will was to leave people free so that some can choose the guidance and those who do not wish to choose the guidance can equally choose uh, misguidance. If God willed, yes, he could have made every soul, he could have made every soul be on the guidance, but he that was not his will to straight jacket every Everyone and pre-program everyone to choose guidance. He has given us free choice. And this is the Quranic teaching in so many uh, verses. That's why the Quran can say, for man sha'a fal mu'min, wa man sha'a fal yakfur, uh, as the, in the verse I quoted uh, earlier. And uh, uh, as for God being forgiving, you say he's not supremely gracious and forgiving if he demands of us something else that we have to uh, uh, 
uh, believe in the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, for example. Well, the fact that God may uh, enjoin upon us certain beliefs and certain practices does not mean that he is not uh, forgiving and, uh, and gracious. Uh, forgiving and gracious means that uh, though he demands of us certain uh, obligations, if we fail in those obligations, he's willing to forgive us. And this is the message of the Quran. Uh, from the beginning to the end, that God is forgiving, he's merciful, and if we fail in what we are obligated, he is willing to forgive us. The Quran says, uh, 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 tell my servants, uh, uh, do not uh, uh, despair of the mercy of God. God forgives all sins. And uh, the, the Quran is assuring us uh, again and again uh, that uh, God is merciful, he is forgiving, and he is wise. As for the uh, Deuteronomy uh, passage saying that God, uh, you know, you should love the God, Lord your God with all your heart and, and soul and so on, I'm actually surprised that you quoted that one because uh, if you are telling us that the, as you will say, that the alternative is to take the Christian view of salvation, what about the idea of loving Jesus? Uh, uh, because that would be uh, contrary to loving Yahweh, the one who called himself father in the Old Testament or who's called father in the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah 63. And uh, that would mean that we are taking that to love that was due to Yahweh and placing that love in another direction towards Jesus. And as William Ellery Channing pointed out uh, in his essays uh, in, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, Christians end up loving Jesus more than they love the Father because they believe that the Father uh, cruelly demanded their lives and Jesus uh, bore the penalty on the cross for them. So naturally, Christians end up loving Jesus more than Yahweh. I think the Islamic concept is clearer, and this uh, is uh, an assurance of salvation by following this method. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shabir. Uh, Reverend Anthony, you have eight minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. I want to begin with Dr. Ali's last point. It's so thrilling to me. Uh, Dr. Ali thinks that he can turn the tables here and say, well, if it's problematic to say that Muhammad must be loved alongside of Allah, uh, that's not a violation of God's law in Deuteronomy 6, uh, unless, of course, I'm willing to grant that it's a violation in the case of Christians who give that love to Jesus. But as Shabir knows, and as I've already demonstrated to Shabir in one of our previous debates, according to the Bible, Jesus is God. Jesus is one with the Father and Holy Spirit, and that's just as certainly revealed in the Old Testament as it is in the New. And so it's not a violation of Deuteronomy 6 to say that one is to love Jesus, but it is shirk by definition to put Muhammad alongside of Allah and make him the supreme object of one's love devotion, submission, and so forth. But I'll come to that latter point more in a minute. Uh, Shabir responded to my statements that the Quran is difficult to interpret and systematize by saying, well, people disagree on what the Bible teaches. Well, first of all, we're not debating the Bible, just like we're not debating the Hadith, as Shabir reminded me. But the point that I was making is that the Quran is in principle difficult to interpret, not because people have their own prejudices and all the rest, which is evidenced when they misinterpret the Bible, but because the Quran's system of uh, presenting things isn't really a system. It's not ordered. We're not told when, where, and how things were revealed. Uh, you'll notice that when Shabir tried to respond to my point about alcohol, he kept saying, well, no, these statements are not in conflict. The earlier statement was not saying something different than the later statement. But notice he refers to one as earlier and one as later. Where does the Quran say that one of them is earlier and the other is later? The Quran does not tell us that. And so we're left arbitrarily assigning when these things were written. But if we don't know the order in which they stand to each other, then we can't accurately try and arrive at an understanding of what they're saying. Uh, moreover, I also pointed out that Surah 3.7 doesn't just say that some things are hard to understand, but that many things are impossible to understand by anyone except for Allah. Allah revealed things that can't be understood by anyone except for him. That strikes me as not only odd, why would he reveal what doesn't reveal anything, but it also creates a problem. How do we know which verses are impossible to interpret? How do we know when we should be incorporating something into our understanding and not? Uh, he said, he objected to my statement that uh, Muhammad must be believed in uh, because he says that, uh, you know, some people can be saved without believing in Muhammad. Well, then, uh, you know, it, it's probably better for Dr. Ali to stop spreading the word of Islam. Because after all, people could be saved without knowing about Muhammad, and if they tell, if they hear about Muhammad and don't believe in him, well, then they would be in a, a load of trouble that they weren't in previously. So it would be very loving for Dr. Ali to stop talking about Islam. 
Uh, he says that it's not problematic that people are told to submit to Muhammad entirely because there are two levels of submission. Where does the Quran say that? That's not stated in the Quran. Uh, but in any case, that's the same thing that could be said by any polytheist who ranked others along with Allah as an object of submission. They would say that Allah is the chief God, and then there are these other things beneath him that are to be uh, submitted to, uh, and that it's not contrary to submission to Allah, since we have two levels of submission here. Uh, he said that, I mean, by the way, the Quran just doesn't say that. You have to render full submission to Muhammad without any dissent in the heart. Uh, we're also told, uh, we, I heard Dr. Ali admit that Muhammad had doubts, he committed sins, and was even rebuked. He gained a lot of confidence in this. Uh, but what kind of confidence is that for people that want salvation? Why would he, we have to believe in this man and entirely submit to this man who was full of doubts, committed sins, and was rebuked? It seems to me that if you're looking for somebody in whom to trust, you ought to look to somebody who had no sins, who was full of faith, had no doubts, and never had to be rebuked by God. I know such a person. I'll tell you about him in our next debate. Uh, Shabir said uh, that uh, Allah is forgiving. It's not like the people's court. Uh, he said, you know, a, a landlord could uh, just waive a fee uh, and, and not hold people accountable for their failure to pay for a previous rent if uh, they pay next month's rent. But that's just not how the Quran presents people being forgiven. It speaks of people uh, needing to believe. It says that they don't really have faith unless they fully submit to Muhammad. That sounds to me like a whole lot of obedience. And it's not gracious. Shabir says that Allah can be uh, gracious, even if he demands things of us and uh, forgives us on that basis. But that entirely misses the point of grace. If it is by works, then it's not by grace. Otherwise, grace is not grace. Grace and works are two contrary or different things. Uh, so I agree that God can be gracious. But if you're saying that God's grace is contingent upon our fallible efforts and our confidence and trust in and submission to a fallible, sinful man, I don't see that as gracious. Uh, he also tried to recover from saying that, uh, you know, Islam does teach predestination. Now, I'm not uh, so much pre uh, objecting to predestination as much as I am to the claim of Ali or Dr. Ali. Sorry, I didn't mean that disrespectfully, that Islam doesn't teach this. It certainly does. It teaches that Allah is the one who chooses who will be guided. And to say that, you know, Allah guides those who believe in him and follow him and so forth. Well, that's a tautology. That's like saying Allah guides those who are guided. It makes no sense. And that's not what the Quran says. It says Allah is the one who sends people astray, Surah 1693. And that Allah is the one who guides whom he wills, the same Surah and Ayah. Uh, Allah uh, will, guides whom he wills, Surah 2856. All of these statements uh, teach that Allah actually determines who is going to be guided and who isn't. It doesn't teach uh, that people simply choose on their own. Their choice is a result of Allah's prior choice, according to the Quran. And Allah seems to be quite pleased with choosing hell for many people. Now, Dr. Ali, I uh, said that uh, people could be saved even if they don't know about Muhammad. I really don't think that's what the Quran teaches in its final teaching, if we could bring in the Hadith and so forth. Uh, the, the problem that arises here is that you do have statements in the Quran that seems to admit into salvation uh, Jews, Christians, Sabaeans, and so forth. Uh, but if we could determine the order of the Quran, we'd see there are other statements that say people who don't believe in Muhammad can't be saved. And so we have to know whether or not one is earlier or later. And we only get that sort of thing from the extra Quranic sources. Without those sources, we don't know what's earlier or later. We're left to arbitrarily assigning dates to them, which the Quran itself doesn't give us. The Quran is not a sufficient book. The Quran is not a clear book. The Quran is not, uh, in principle, even capable of being understood in many cases by Allah's own admission, Surah 3 7. And so, for all of these reasons, I really don't know how anybody could uh, follow this with any kind of confidence. And that leads me to another point that I'll make here, which is that no Muslim can be confident of their salvation. And so, in fact, I would actually challenge Dr. Ali to uh, tell everybody here whether or not he knows for certain that he will be in paradise. I, as a Christian, can say that for reasons I'm going to give in our next debate. But no Muslim can say that. Muhammad couldn't even say that. Muhammad said, I don't know what he's going to do with me. So, 
uh, and, and all of this flows from all the stuff that I've been talking about. Muhammad was a man who was full of sins and doubts. Allah doesn't forgive people apart from entire submission. Uh, you know, there are all these things that are bound up in it, and the revelation of Allah is not clear. How could anybody possibly have an assurance of salvation based on all of these uh, uh, un incoherent things? Oh, sorry, I thought it was my time, but I'll, I'll conclude there since I stopped. Okay, thank you, Reverend Anthony. So we're now entering into our closing arguments. And for the chat, if you guys could submit your questions for our debaters and type um, your question all in caps or type in question all in caps and then your question and um, we'll get to them. So um, now we're entering our closing statements. Uh, Dr. Ali, you have four minutes. So I'll start with your last one, confidence in salvation. Uh, some Christians uh, work with this idea that uh, there is the perseverance of the saints. Once you're a Christian, you'll always be a Christian. Uh, but of course, First uh, John, the letter in the Bible, uh, shows that uh, Christians may actually fall into sin. And if anyone says that they, they have not sinned, then uh, you know they're lying. And, and yet the same letter says that uh, you have the seed of God in you, and therefore you cannot sin. So obviously... Uh, this uh, is a very difficult topic for, even for the Christian writers of the New Testament. And uh, this is a topic that's debated among Christians to this day. This book is entitled Four Views on Eternal Security. And uh, in the introduction, it is pointed out that even Paul himself, the writer in the New Testament, uh, had doubts about uh, his own eternal uh, salvation. So the idea that Christians think that, okay, we are saved and this is a done deal, this is uh, incorrect. It's not even based on the Bible. And on the Bible, it, it is clear that uh, Jesus, when he comes back, will dismiss some people who did miraculous things in his uh, name. Uh, so uh, they thought that we're safe, but uh, really they are not. As for Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, saying Jesus is, uh, you know, that you, can, you cannot love anyone else than Yahweh. You must love Yahweh with all your hearts, all your soul, and so on. Well, uh, you know, either Jesus is Yahweh or you cannot love Jesus if you take it in the literal way in which uh, Anthony was uh, presenting. But if we say that Jesus is a prophet of God, you can love God as God, love the prophet of God as the prophet of God, love your wife as your wife, love your father as your father, your mother as mother, and your children as your children, then it doesn't mean because you love your father and your mother and your children that that means you do not love uh, Yahweh with all of your heart. But yes, to love someone else who is not Yahweh as though he were Yahweh, as though this was God, that is shirk. So loving Jesus at that level, that would be shirk. But that's not the level at which the Muslims are um, enjoined to love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In fact, the Quran is very clear that the Prophet Muhammad is only a prophet, is servant of God, and he is not under any circumstances to be regarded uh, as God. For example, in the last uh, verse of the 18th uh, chapter, Anthony, you say the Quran is difficult to interpret because it's not really a system. Well, then the Bible you think is really a system. Look at all the differences uh, among the writers in the Bible. I've already mentioned one just within one letter of one uh, writer. And then you say, but well, we cannot know which is earlier or later. In fact, my interpretation of those verses of the Quran dealing with alcohol does not need to depend on what is earlier or what is later. What we can say is that all of these verses uh, actually fit together in a harmonious way. For example, a verse which says that the benefits of alcohol are there, but the harms are greater, that still applies regardless of when it was revealed, whether before or after. And uh, the prohibition of drinking it, that still applies, whether it was before or after. So Muslims are prohibited from drinking alcohol, even though one can argue that there are some benefits uh, in alcohol, and the Quran is agreeing. Uh, with that. So as for some things being impossible to understand, why would God reveal them? Well, that's in God's wisdom. Why would God say some things uh, in a particular way? Maybe we'll understand them uh, later on. Uh, maybe maybe uh, now we come to see that some of the mutashabihat, the beginning letters of some of the chapters of the Quran, have uh, uh, deep meaning and they have numerical significance, which I know that Anthony does not accept, as we know from our last debate. Uh, but, uh, but to Muslims, uh, there is a reason. And uh, one can dismiss any book and say, this is uh, not, not understandable, we don't understand this, we reject it, and so on. But that's up to you. You reject the word of God uh, to your own uh, damnation. And uh, as for the two levels of submission, uh, when Jesus says uh, that, uh, you know, call no one on earth your father, what he means is don't call them your father at the level at which you're calling God your father. Otherwise, what are you to call your own biological father? 
I'll leave it at that. So go ahead. Clarification, I have four minutes at this point. Yes, you do. Okay, thank you so much. Again, Dr. Ali. Uh, Dr. Ali seems to keep missing the point that I'm making uh, in a number of cases. When I objected to the Quran not being a system, it wasn't just simply to the fact that it's not systematic. It's to the fact that it can't be systematized. So it's irrelevant to say the Bible is not laid out systematically. I think it can be systematized. And it's also irrelevant to bring up the Bible here. We're talking about the Quran, not the Bible. Remember, I was reminded we're not talking about the Hadith. The, the, uh, the straw man is further brought in in the fact that I'm not simply saying that some things are difficult. I'm saying it's due to the very nature of the Quran, not to the other sorts of things that I think would account for misinterpretation in the case of the Bible and other things. The Quran is not uh, laid out in order. We don't know when certain things were given. We don't know why they were given. We don't know where they were given. We don't have the context for these things. And the context is critical for interpreting anything. Uh, we also had a straw man, I think, when it, it, it came to uh, the issue of, uh, I mean, a number of other issues. I'll, I'll try and come to those in a, in a moment. Uh, but uh, we, we still uh, hear Dr. Ali saying that, you know, we can have these two levels of submission to Muhammad. Again, he's not dealing with the arguments that I made in response to that. We're told by Muslims that shirk is submitting to anyone other than Allah. We're sub to submit to him alone. Now, I'd certainly grant that the idea there is that he is to be submitted to absolutely. But that's the very statement that's being made in Surah 4 about Muhammad. One must render entire submission to him. And there's not to be any dissent in the heart. And one's salvation, their very faith, is determined by whether or not they're submitting to him. Uh, I, uh, and then we're also uh, told that this man had doubts and he was sinful. Why in the world would I be trusting in a man for my salvation who is full of doubts and sinful and needed to be rebuked constantly? Uh, that's certainly not a foundation for one's faith. That's why the Quran is right when it talks about believing in God, though it doesn't have the right God. Uh, and it, it's right because it agrees with the Bible. But uh, it, it just goes off the rails here when it constantly puts Muhammad before our eyes. Uh, Muhammad is not a worthy object of faith. He was fallible. He was sinful. He was full of doubts. Uh he, he went back, Dr. Ali, to this fact of, uh, you know, Deuteronomy 6, 4, that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. According to the Bible, the God of the Bible is triune. He's triune from beginning to end. The first chapter of the Bible, God says, let us make man in our image. Throughout the New Testament, we're told that man who fell from that original condition is being renewed into the image that uh, he was originally made in, that is the image of Christ by the Spirit. The God of the Bible is triune. Man was made in that God's image. So when we love Christ with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, together with the Father and the Spirit, we're not loving somebody in addition to God. Uh, uh, and and uh, so it's, it's not comparable when you turn around and say, well, we can do this towards Muhammad as well. Uh, that simply doesn't uh, work. Uh, so I have numerous problems with the Quranic doctrine of salvation. And, uh, you know, when, when Shabir, again, brings up the Bible in order to rescue uh, the fact that the Quran can provide no assurance, and he says the Bible doesn't teach this either, and he even mentions Paul. I'll simply conclude in the words of Paul and let people judge for themselves if Paul taught that you can have assurance. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one that condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, the one who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God. Who could possibly separate us from the love of Christ? Can tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Paul says, no, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Okay, thank you, Reverend Anthony Rogers. That was great. Okay, so now comes, we got our questions in, and this one is for Dr. Shabir Ali, and you will have two minutes to answer. So this question says, um, can all Muslims ask for, just ask for forgiveness and ask Allah for salvation instead of fulfilling all five pillars, even though they had the ability to fulfill all of them? You have two minutes. Dr. Shabir, you're muted. As long as one has life and, and breath, one can ask for forgiveness for God from God, and God is willing to forgive. Of course, uh, God is demanding of us as much as we have the ability to fulfill the obligations. But uh, the, fulfilling the obligations is not the absolute uh, final uh, answer to this. The final answer is God's willingness to forgive, and God might forgive people even who have not fulfilled the obligations. Of course, we should try to fulfill our obligations and then ask for forgiveness. Uh, but uh, if if one dies without fulfilling the obligations, it is still possible that God may forgive that uh, person, though as such uh, a forgiveness should not be our, our reliance. Like we should not rely on that ahead of time thinking, okay, let me not do anything good and just rely on God's forgiveness. No, God is forgiving, but he is also uh, strict and he may punish. Uh, but the fact that God is forgiving, uh, uh, you know, gives us great hope that even people who die uh, without uh, the the proper uh, actions to go with their lives uh, will be forgiven and uh, eventually saved. Okay, thank you. Anthony, would you like to uh, respond to that? You have one minute. Thank you. Um, yeah, notice that Dr. Ali said, Allah might, Allah might, Allah might forgive, Allah might relent and so forth. How can anybody possibly repose their confidence in such a thing? How can you put your head on the pillow at night knowing that he might forgive you for not obeying him? That just doesn't strike me as really an assurance of salvation. It's not a, a promise that's given to people that they can really rely on. Moreover, the Quran doesn't simply leave it at that. Over and over again, it says that uh, the person who believes has to have has to entirely submit to Muhammad or their faith is not genuine. So you have to have entire submission to even hope that Allah might forgive your failure to perform these deeds, which are supposedly going to be weighed in the balance. I, I just don't see how all of this works. And I understand why the, the, uh, the notes of uncertainty constantly have to mark any kind of Islamic answer that's given to this. Might, 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 may, may, may. Okay, thank you. Okay, and this question is for Reverend Anthony Rogers. Christians often disagree on salvation. Some say it's by faith, only some say by faith and works. If both can't be right, who is, and does that put the other group outside of Christianity? You have two minutes. Well, I can be very brief here because Dr. Ali and I are going to be debating this subject in our following debate at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, my conviction, as I'll argue in that debate, is that a person is saved on the basis of Christ's person and work alone, but that salvation is comprehensive. He doesn't just justify a person, that is, deliver a person from their guilt on the basis of his death and perfect life. He also sanctifies people by pouring out his spirit upon them, enabling them to do good works from the heart. So salvation is a salvation from guilt and corruption, not simply uh, from guilt. Uh, so. My answer, though, is fundamentally that we are justified through faith in Christ alone. Uh, but that faith by through which we're justified itself produces good works in people. So it's not the works that saves. It's the faith. It's Christ that saves through faith. OK, thank you, Dr. Shabir. You have one minute. Uh, Anthony's answer uh, brings uh, brings up another another question. Like, what what's the what did Jesus' uh, death on the cross do? Because if before Jesus' death on the cross, people had to do good works, if after Jesus' death on the cross, people will still do good works, and if they didn't do good works, then that will prove that they're not genuine Christians and that Jesus didn't really die for them. They're not one of the elect persons. Uh, then it means that in the end, the, the death of Jesus didn't really ch change anything. And after going through all of this whole saga, God killing his son on the cross, 
it would mean that people are still in the same desperate situation. They have to continue to do all of the good works as they were doing before Jesus died on the cross. So uh, the, 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 the Christian idea of salvation really is uh, an attempt to make good sense of the uh, view that Jesus died on the cross. And then the question was, why did such a good man have to die? And then Christians came up with multiple answers to try and justify the, 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 the view that Jesus died on the cross. It must have been for some good purpose, they think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. And this question is for you, Dr. Ali. It says, if you don't believe in original sin, but believe humans are fallible, do you or the Quran hold to an age of accountability? And if so, what is that age? So that age of accountability is not uh, defined in the Quran, but we know from the Quran that uh, it is uh, that, you know, reasonably interpreting the Quran, God says in the Quran, God does not demand of a person more than that person is capable of. And we can assess that children grow up, they're innocent, they come uh, into teenage years, now they can uh, feel a sense of responsibility, they can understand God's commandments and demands, and they can understand the uh, moral crimes uh, and sins and, and avoid those. So the, at a certain time, they, they reach that age of responsibility. Now, outside of the Quran, Muslim theologians might set certain ages uh, based on indications from Hadith and other sources, uh, so, and based on their personal observations. Some will say 15 years for boys, 12 years for girls, uh, no, uh, noting uh, when a girl starts to menstruate or when a boy uh, starts to have wet dreams or something of this nature or beard on the chin, uh, they, they would say, okay, this person has matured and that person now becomes morally uh, responsible. And uh, this uh, idea of moral responsibility, um, it gets me thinking about uh, humankind on the whole and what it means for uh, the, uh, the, for, for the story of Adam and Eve being in the garden. They were there innocent. This is humankind in its infancy. And uh, as they are growing up as human beings now, uh, they, they come to understand certain things. They become morally responsible. God uh, chooses uh, this uh, couple, uh, well, Adam, especially from the Quranic point of view, because Eve's name is not mentioned in the Quran, so it's Adam and his spouse. God uh, chooses them and, and gives that revelation to Adam and set of instructions to pass on to his children and uh, other people around him. So Adam becomes the first prophet. That's when humankind uh, reaches that age of uh, responsibility so that they can accept the moral commandments of God. So the whole Islamic system actually makes a very good sense from beginning all the way from the Garden of Eden to our present uh, observations in life. Okay, thank you. Reverend Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, I think it only makes sense if you leave out critically important details. She, Dr. Ali said that people are not, they're, they're innocent uh, in, you know, when they're born and in their youth because they don't yet know Allah and his commandments. But earlier in the debate, Dr. Ali referred to the Islamic concept of fitra, which means that everybody's born knowing Allah. And so when we observe the fact that these children that come into the world already know God, and by virtue of that ought to be thankful to him, uh, they're the very sorts of people that have to be taught to say thank you, right? They, they don't have to be taught to say no, that just seems to come naturally to children. No, 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 I'm not going to do this. But telling a child to say thank you, please, and all those sorts of things seem to be going against the grain of children. Why are they bent on these sorts of things uh, when they're supposedly born already knowing Allah? Moreover, uh, we're also told that the reason everybody knows Allah even from birth is because before man was ever born, Allah stroked Adam's back and brought out of it his descendants and made them stand before him and confess uh, that he is God. So again, uh, the Islamic sources teach that everybody knows God when they're born. And so there isn't this ignorance that uh, seems no. to be assumed okay. here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Reverend Rogers, this one's for you. Uh, it is unreasonable that one person should be punished for another's wrong. Likewise, it is unreasonable that one should go unpunished just because another claims to take their punishment. How can you say that God is so unjust as to not hold the guilty accountable for their own sins? Well, number one, the whole message that Dr. Ali's been presenting is that people are not going to be held accountable for their sins. That's the concept of forgiveness. Now, Christians maintain that God does that while remaining just. The Islamic system teaches that God does that without remaining just. We're not exactly talking about the Christian system right now. That's our next debate. Uh, I understand people also want to ask me questions, but right now we're, we're focused on the Islamic teachings on those matters. I'll give you an earful in our next debate. 
but it, again, I mean, the, the, the Quran doesn't simply teach that, uh, you know, other things. I mean, it, it, there's a concept of sacrifice in Islam. We're told that uh, Abraham's son was ransomed by a great sacrifice. So there is that concept. And then we have this notion of uh, people's sins being atoned for in the Quranic sources. And although we're not talking about the Hadith, I do think it fills in the details of some of this where it says that Jews and Christians will be uh, made to atone for the sins of Muslims. They're going to go to hell because the sins of Jews and Christians are placed upon them. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the sins of Muslims are placed upon them. So I, I, if, if that's unjust, according to Muslims, uh, then I think they should take that up with their own sources. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shabir, one minute. I'm amazed that even though Anthony had acknowledged that our topic is not about hadith, he keeps referring back to hadith again and again. So I can only appeal to you, my friend Anthony, please stick to the topic. As for the question, it does seem uh, uh, really um, unreal for God to have his son die on the cross uh, innocently for the guilt of the guilty, whereas the Bible says very clearly in Ezekiel, the entire chapter 18, uh, that the wicked is uh, going to pay for their own sins. Uh, it's not that the guilty is going to uh, be relieved by the innocent dying for them. And then for God to kill his own son, it uh, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would God kill his son uh, if, uh, you know, if God wants to forgive the people, he can forgive them. And that's not contrary to justice. I think, Anthony, you misunderstand what justice means. If I forgive somebody who has wronged me, it doesn't mean there's some injustice here done in the world. It means that, yes, initially there was some injustice, but when I forgive it, then it's all evened out. It's balanced. It's done. It's uh, there. There is no one needed to pay for the sins that somebody has committed in this case because there is forgiveness. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shabir. Okay, and this question is for you. Uh, it says, you seem to have said that we can do good works or believe and be steadfast. Were these meant to be two different ways of salvation or the same way expressed in different terms? It seems that this is the same thing expressed in two different ways, but also with some uh, variation in that if, if one has life and breath and so on, one can believe and, and, and do good works. One may not live long enough to do good works. Let's say uh, somebody has just momentarily come to believe and then there is no opportunity to do any good works. Uh, well, in, in the Muslim understanding of, of in my understanding of the Quran, that person will be saved because that person did not have the ability uh, to do something. And the Quran itself says, be aware of God and fulfill your duty to God as much as you are able. Uh, and uh, uh, the previous verse I mentioned, God does not burden the soul with more than it's capable of doing. So one might uh, not be able to do good works. And then the idea of steadfastness uh, is uh, meaning, uh, it, it means something like remaining on the course, remaining on the path. Uh, and, and that is not very cl clearly defined. So it may be that that some people could not do all of the works that are enjoined in the Islamic faith uh, or in the Quran itself, but at the same time, this person is steadfastly in love with God, uh, sincere in one's belief and faith in God, that person in the end uh, will be saved. Okay, thank you. Anthony? Yeah, so I've already given my objections to this, this whole notion of faith and works. Number one, it's not faith in Allah alone, but faith in Allah and Muhammad, and that includes full submission to Muhammad, a man who is sinful, full of doubts, and needed to frequently be uh, rebuked. Uh, I've also pointed out that the Quranic system doesn't simply teach that sins will be forgiven uh, so that you know we can rely on good works. It uh, teaches that all sorts of things are necessary for that forgiveness, which isn't really grace. Uh, so I, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I've already made, I think, a full case in, in, in the debate, and, and people can just go back and review that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and this last question is for you. Um, it says, the founder of Christianity, Paul, said that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, your religion is no good, 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proofs. What is your extraordinary proof that Jesus rose from the dead if he was killed? Well, number one, Paul was not the founder of Christianity. Number two, the idea that the, uh, the Messiah would rise from the dead is not, first of all, something proclaimed in the New Testament. It's already anticipated in the Old Testament, not only in explicit promises 
and prophecies, but also through types and shadows in the entire ceremonial system that God delivered to the people of Israel. It's the entire point of the Old Testament. Uh, but again, we're going to be debating that in our next debate. So the extraordinary proof, which even Muslims ought to accept, is that if God declares it through his prophets, well, then it's true. No more extraordinary proof to ground our faith could possibly be given than God's own word. Now, that, of course, pushes us back to, well, can we trust this word? Is this the word of God? And, uh, you know, that's a whole other debate. Uh, so uh, my extraordinary proof is the proclamation of God in the prophetic scriptures and in the apostolic writings. And if you want reasons for believing why that's the word of God, well, then we need to have a debate on that. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shabir? Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there is a, a new book uh, entitled uh, When Christians Were Jews, written by Paula Fredrickson. And uh, as she points out, uh, the Jews at the time of Jesus did not have the idea that Jesus was going, to, or the Messiah, that the Messiah is going to die and resurrect uh, from the dead. The idea that the Messiah will resurrect from the dead uh, is read back by some Christians into the Old Testament. In fact, the verses that they pick to support that view from the Old Testament actually show somebody who comes close to dying but doesn't actually die. For example, the 16th uh, Psalm. And uh, as for the Paul being the founder of Christianity, actually some uh, scholars have described him so, uh, thus, thus in the title of the book by um, Gord Ludeman, uh, Paul the founder of uh, Christianity. In fact, many of the doctrines related to atonement and the blood sacrifice of Jesus come directly out of Paul's writings and uh, out of the letter to the Hebrews. For example, the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. Who wrote that? Paul. Okay, thank you. And now for our final remarks, we have two minutes and Dr. Shabir, yeah. Sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end here, and uh, I'm so glad that we had this uh, discussion, and uh, I pray that God will uh, continue to help us to uh, understand uh, our mutual faith uh, in, in a better way than before. I think I have a better understanding now of uh, Christianity than when I started, and I hope that some people will say they, they have, uh, you know, arrived at a better understanding of the Islamic faith in, in the end. Uh, the topic that we have discussed is very important. It has to deal with eternal salvation, and uh, I have uh, um, presented a case that uh, Muslims can uh, entertain the likelihood that uh, non-Muslims will also enter heaven. It seems that uh, this is more in line with the, with the mercy and, and uh, forgiveness of God. Uh, but of course, at the same time, Muslims can have the assurance that the Islamic system uh, almost guarantees the person will enter heaven. Uh, Anthony says, well, Shabir is saying, you know, maybe and so on. But of course, there's a certain maybe in the, the Christian view as well, at least in as, as many interpreters will, will hold. Uh, for example, Norman Geisler writing in this book uh, entitled uh, Four Views on Eternal Security uh, shows that he does not accept the idea of irresistible grace. That means once a Christian, not necessarily always a Christian, one can fall away. And though one might be boasting at one time that I am saved, maybe later on they're no longer Christian and thus they're no longer saved. Or they, they think they're still Christian, but Jesus comes back and says, get away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. So ultimately, to me, the Islamic view that there is only one God who is in total control of all things, the devil cannot take people away from God. If people sincerely choose to worship God, uh, God will save them and protect them in the end. The Quran is very clear. Those who say, my Lord is God and remain steadfast on them, the angels will descend upon them saying, no fear, nor grief shall come upon you. We are your friends in this life and the life hereafter. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Shabir. And Anthony, Reverend Anthony, you have uh, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for this debate. Uh, I think this is our fifth debate. I look forward to more and certainly our debate coming up in just a little while. Uh, in my uh, comments to Dr. Ali, I raised several objections. Number one, that the Quran is in principle an incoherent book that resists exegesis and systematization. That in itself ought to be alarming to anybody who's looking to this book for salvation. How can you look to this book on such a momentous issue when it's so uh, haphazardly put together and insufficient in terms of its deliverances? 
Uh, I did bring up the Hadith numerous times, not because I expect Shabir to deal with them, but simply because it reminds us that there's more that's said because the Quran is incomplete. And uh, also because I'm used to listening to Sunni Muslims, I recognize Dr. Ali is less than comfortable with the uh, Hadith, the, the Sunni narrations, uh, or the, found, the narrations found in the Sunnah than other Muslims. Uh, I also pointed out that one must put their faith in Allah and Muhammad. That doesn't strike me as consistent with Tawheed, especially since it says that one's faith is contingent on believing in Muhammad's person, not simply in the revelations that come through him. Indeed, the Quran is not even said to be from Muhammad. It's simply something Muhammad is relaying to people. So when the Quran talks about believing in Muhammad, it's not talking about the words of the Quran. It's talking about Muhammad's person. We're also told that people have to make Muhammad dearer to them than any other creature. That's a violation of the law of God, what God calls idolatry. Uh, we're also told that people have to render entire submission to Muhammad. This is the heart and soul of Islam, supposedly submitting to Allah alone, but not so according to the Quran, 465, you have to render full submission to Muhammad or your faith is not genuine. And then coupled with this is the fact that Muhammad was fallible, he was sinful, he was prone to doubts, he had to be rebuked. Why would you be looking to a man who had all of these problems, all these things not going for him, right? Why, if you're already looking, uh, if you need to look to God for salvation because you yourself are sinful and fallible and full of doubts, why look to a man uh, in order to somehow get you out of this predicament? We also saw that the Quran speaks of people atoning for their sins by other deeds. I, I, I find okay. that. Okay, we're all set. Okay. All right, okay. thank you. Um, all right, so this concludes our debate. I would like to thank everyone for joining us and to go to um, the ministry. So go to www.ministrytomuslims.com for the link for the next debate. And the next debate is at two o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time and five o'clock um, Eastern Time. So go there and the next debate will be um, uh, affirming, wait, what was that? Yeah, affirming, um, yeah, hold on. I, all right, well, the next debate, go, go check it out. It's on the link and um, we'll see you there at five. Thank you.